Uh, well, thank you, Kevin, for having embarrassed me enormously <laughs> and set ridiculous expectations. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm delighted to be here and I thank the organizers and I have had occasion to work with many of you over the years, so it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to do something different. I, I could have talked about BioCreative. Um, but I'm going to talk instead about uh, getting off the gold standard, uh, which is a topic I think that cuts across a lot of uh, what you've been hearing about already today and we'll hear about more later and during the hackathon. Um, this card will be, um, let's see, this is the pointer, right? Um, yeah, this is, um, the Americans will recognize this, or the older Americans anyway, will recognize this as a card from Monopoly. Um, and that was actually the first time I had heard about the gold standard and uh, wondered what it was. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, in terms of today's uh, activities, why should we think about getting off the gold standard? And I think this has already come up. Gold standards are expensive. Experts are hard to find and hard to train to the task if you need to train them. Uh, annotation is expensive and time consuming. Um, I think everybody knows that not all that glitters is a gold standard. Um, experts disagree, and the truth may not be known. There really may not be any so-called ground truth. Um, there may only be maybe a consensus, if you're lucky, among human experts. Um, some tasks don't have a gold standard, and that includes a very important set of tasks, namely interactive tasks with the human in the loop. So what are we going to do about that? Um, so I'm going to, this is sort of the message of the talk, so if I don't make it all the way through my too many slides, um, you will know what I'm going to tell you. Um, what are the alternatives? Well, we need to understand the cost drivers of um, annotation and creating gold standards. And in particular, there are very complicated trade-offs between quantity, quality, and potential reuse. Um, and some of that's already come up in terms of taking real tasks, in which case you're kind of constraint the real task as opposed to taking abstractions and more general tasks and they're less tied to real use. Um, the, another alternative is leveraging existing expert curated data sets and I loved um, George's talk um, in terms of being able to take real, a real task that's going on at NLM in terms of mesh headings um, and use that and I'll give you another quick example. Um, but the idea is to use existing data as a starting point to reduce costs. And you can also leverage, if you're lucky, the existing experts who already know how to do the task and have already done it a lot. So that's, a, that's an alternative. Using less than gold standards, it's interesting, nobody, I guess, um, I think George mentioned crowdsourcing um, as one of the alternatives and semi-automated annotation as another way of reducing costs. And finally, um, it might be worth thinking about um, you know, one-off gold standards where you can put the human back in the loop and look at human system teaming and learning while you're actually doing the task. So that's, those are the alternatives. I'm going to go through this very fast just because I introduced the, the talk with a Monopoly card. So um, I did a little bit of digging um, in preparation for this and looked up, for example, the definition of a standard which was kind of interesting. It's a level of quality or attainment on the one hand, and it's something used as a measure or norm or model um, in comparative evaluations. Um, this was actually from uh, a, an entry in the Oxford Dictionaries online. Um, gold standard um, is typically a, uh, what was initially the value of a currency or the way you set the value of a currency um, but it turns out to have a lot of other different uses in the uh, in, in different fields. So just to go through a couple of those in economics or banking, as I said, gold standard refers to a monetary system or exchange system. Um, in medicine and clinical trials, I was interested to see that it's um, you, you get the expression the um, randomized clinical uh, randomized control trial is often considered the gold standard for a clinical trial, and that's a methodology. It's not a, a, an annotated corpus as we're used to thinking of it. Um, for biocuration, um, a gold standard is referred to often by the curators um, as um, what you get out of the expert curated literature, even though everybody 
knows, or certainly the bioinformaticians and computational biologists know that it's not always perfect by any means. And of course, then there's the use in natural language processing. Um, and this is actually a, a quote out of um, uh, Amber Stubbs and James Pustyovsky's Natural Language Annotation for Machine Learning book. And they go through this whole notion of you, you know, have several people do it and you adjudicate it. So there's this notion of gold standard as annotated, as adjudicated annotated corpus in NLP. So there are a bunch of different um, definitions. Um, what I want to point out is that at least in biology, gold standard development is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. Um, it enables comparison of effective, uh, the effectiveness of alternative methods for a particular task, ideally, and using the best available standards. Biocuration, by contrast, is an activity, or it could be one of those ends that you're talking about using a gold standard for. And um, I would argue that reducing costs of biocuration is really a good target application. And of course, that's uh, one of the focuses of this conference or workshop. Um, so I'm going to go through quickly four case studies here. Um, and they involve, first of all, some work I did quite a while ago trying to figure out if we had any handle on the cost of curation. Um, and I'm leaving out most of it, but I'll pick up a couple cases that have directly you know, to do with the biomedical annotation. Um, tell you about um, a, a, an experiment we did actually back in BioCreative 2 on leveraging expert curated data, um, which was the gene normalization task from BioCreative. Um, tell you about actually one experiment on crowdsourcing that we did um, with researchers at um, NCBI. Uh, and then finally, looking very quickly at an example when no gold standard exists, so a lightweight interactive evaluation using what we call tag a little, learn a little, where you're kind of simultaneously annotating data, retraining the tagger, and iterating in that loop. Um, so case study number one, cost of curation. So here's what we normally think of as the curation cycle. You um, specify the task, you define some guidelines, you do some preliminary annotation, you look at how much the annotators disagree with each other and decide that your guidelines weren't good enough, so then you revise them and you go through this loop until you're satisfied that you can get roughly reasonable inter-annotator agreement. Um, you know, you can use a Kappa statistic or just inter pairwise inter-annotator agreement. Um, and when you're done with that, then you actually go into the production annotation and you produce your gold standard. Um, I have associated these first five with the setup costs. So this is before, this is just to get ready to do the annotation. And for better or worse, um, these costs are rarely measured and documented and they often take months. Um, the production annotation can mean several different things, but it's when you're actually starting to, you know, do the data that you're going to use for training and test data. Um, so, and it's been very hard to find um, good data on cost, quality, quantity trade-offs. And I will point out later an instance where we are um, culpable of doing the same thing as failing to measure the setup cost because it was really embarrassing because it took us years to set up the task. Um, so here are a couple examples. Um, this is one that actually Kevin was very involved in. Um, some collaborative work with the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database and the task was curation of full text articles for deposit in a database, namely the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database or CTD. Um, so they had three classes of entities, genes, diseases, and chemicals that they were curating and they were curating the relationships uh, among these. Um, they had a very, have actually, they're still going and doing great, uh, they have a very um, sophisticated pipeline and they were doing curating about 6,000 articles a year and some special projects. Um, they had some nice statistics that they already knew, which was interesting. Um, they spend 93% of their time on curatable papers and only 7% on rejecting papers. So they have a pretty good process for finding the things that have the information in them that they want. Um, 
and they had some statistics for us that average cure time for a curatable paper is about 20 minutes a paper with about 30 annotations in the paper and so that gives you the steady state uh, figures of about $10 a paper assuming your curator makes $30 an hour and about 33 cents an interaction. They actually um, were kind enough to really measure thoroughly and carefully their precision and recall on the on the curated data, which most many curation teams are reluctant to do for two reasons. One of them very good, which is that they have to they're under the gun to get a lot of work done as quickly as possible. And measuring these kinds of things is extra work that doesn't add to their throughput. Um, the other reason that people curators don't like to do it is the results are often not wonderful. So average precision inter annotator agreement was pretty good. Average recall, so different curators curate different things. That's pretty typical, actually. So these, I have some other data from um, another curation experiment performed in BioCreative One, which is, is quite similar to this, actually, for um, gene ontology annotators. Um, so that's that. Here's a second example. Um, from de-identification of clinical notes. Um, and the, uh, so I, probably most of you know, at, at least in the U.S., you have to remove personal health information or PHI and there are these 18 classes of information, you know, things like patient name, social security number, phone number, date, um, so on. Actually, the hospitals then make you also add doctor and hospital um, information because they don't want you to know what, uh, where it came from. And the annotators need to identify and redact all these kinds of um, personal health information corpus. We actually, in conjunction with um, our collaborators, um, David Carroll, who was at Group Health Cooperative and now is at Kaiser, and Brad Mallon, who's at Vanderbilt, um, we did an experiment with them where we asked how well do um, annotators do this. Um, they had four annotators, um, about a thousand PHI instances, um, and they estimated that the cost was about $7.50 per patient note per annotator, um, and so it's about 70 cents per annotation. Um, the really interesting parts are the quality and how much the quality is affected by the number of annotators. So here's that graph. Um, so the um, recall, all right, the cost is in the red line here and it goes up linearly with the number of annotators. The recall hits this interesting knee. So you go from about 95% recall to about, um, I, don't know, I think it's 99.5% recall um, with when you use two annotators. Recall is critical for um, this kind of redaction because you don't want to leak any, you know, of the protected information. So that's why it's, it's actually, in this case, more important than precision. This is some interesting data from a, a paper we published, the cost. So the cost per um, uh, individual uh, for, for, for one annotator is about $2.76. The, the marginal cost to get the next um, increment go, goes up to about $24. And then as you add additional annotators, you're getting very little additional, you're protecting very little additional information. So it gets more and more and more expensive um, as you add more annotators, which is not surprising, but it's interesting that you get good enough results um, with two annotators in, in this particular small experiment. So here's a summary of um, a, a bunch of data that I was able to collect. Um, this is a linguistic annotation uh, activity prop bank. Um, this is two of the I2B2 data sets. This is the de-identification work I just talked about. And this is the comparative toxicogenomics. What you'll see here is kind of surprised me. And that is that things, the cost varies from about 27 cents to about a dollar per annotation, per entity annotated. Um, obviously, um, how much it costs per document depends on how many annotations there are um, and the density. The other thing to notice here is the time here. And by and large, it's unclear that this included all the setup costs. Um, but anyway, the time is measured in weeks here. So 
somewhere between seven weeks at the fastest. This was a very, very efficient pipeline to on the order of, you know, almost a year. Um, so that's um, what I had to say about cost at the moment. Um, so case study number two was reusing expert curated data. And this is what I have subtitled the biocreative design principles. Um, focus on tasks of relevance to biologists. Um, keeping the task as realistic as possible because the idea is we want to leverage data that's already been curated um, and ideally the curators who've curated it in order to make this tractable. Um, and the gene normalization task that I'm going to tell you about was part of the, is part of a curation pipeline for model organism databases and for the human um, gene annotation activities with the one important difference that turned out to be uh, costly, which was that we were using abstracts because they were generally available, but of course real curators use full text when, it, when they can get it and when they need it. Um, another principle is use standards and open resources where available. Obviously the open resources had to do with um, you know, abstracts which are available and then these kinds of standards from the uh, computational biology community. Uh, and making exist, um, available existing data. Um, what you can do if you have that is you get a lot of partially annotated training data, roughly for free if there's a task that people are already doing. It just isn't nicely, it doesn't have the property that every single mention is tagged because um, curators obviously aren't interested in that. They're interested in extracting the information they need for the database. Um, but you can leverage these to create smaller uh, training and test sets um, using additional annotation. So <clears throat> this was the task definition for the BioCreative 2 gene normalization task for each abstract. Um, for, we were just looking in this task for human genes because the year before we had done it, or I'm sorry, two years before we'd done it for fly, mouse, and yeast. Um, this time we're doing it for human genes. Um, get the list of or what you're supposed to do for each abstract is uh, provide the list of the unique um, entree gene identifiers that are mentioned in that abstract and a text mention uh, of that particular gene, one text mention per identifier, just so that we can check that you're doing the right thing. Um, uh, the key features of this task were that the response is at the level of the abstract or article. It's not at the level of the mention. And this was um, something we, we did in the first BioCreative 2. And it's important because when you're doing the mention level, it's, a, it's too much annotation. It's not a task that a biologist really does. Um, and it causes all kinds of other problems. Um, so the responses in terms of the unique identifiers, you use the text strings as evidence, and um, we leveraged the annotation of papers curated by the GOA team at EBI. Um, this is just an example of an abstract, and it shows you that there was one human gene mentioned in here, and so this is what you return as the, um, the system response for that abstract. Um, we collected um, uh, 1,100 uh, PubMed identifiers that have been used. We um, picked 5,000 of those as partially annotated training data. And then we did some additional manu manual annotation to generate the training and test sets. As I said, it was complicated because sometimes something was annotated in the full text that wasn't, did not appear in the abstract. So we had to kind of get rid of those and just sort of re-annotate the abstract, but it certainly saved us a fair amount of time. And we also did a small inter-annotator agreement experiment with about 90% inter-annotator agreement, which looked good. The other thing we did that I think was very useful was we, when we got back the results from 20 groups, 54 runs, we did some answer pooling in order to check the gold standard. And for each team, we selected the best uh, run and re, re, then re-examine any annotation where more than 50% of the groups or 50% or more of the groups disagreed with what we had down, e e either direction. Um, the outcome was that we added 32 annotations and removed 21 annotations. And that amounted to about the, you know, a 7% change. 
I don't think it actually changed any of the ordering of the, the way the teams perform, but it did leave us with a, a pretty high quality gold standard data set that had been checked in by this method. So overall, it was a fairly efficient way of doing this task. Um, okay, and just, this was just the results and the human, the human genes are the um, diamonds, the red diamonds, which are probably hard to see. Turns out that uh, yeast is by far the easiest to do. Um, and uh, so anyway, this is the result of two biocreatives just to show a result. Um, the third thing I'm going to talk about is crowdsourcing. Um, so, and one of the questions we asked is crowdsourcing an al alternative to expert annotation. It's been used, it's being used increasingly widely now in a lot of AI related or machine learning related tasks because it's very, it's a very cheap way to get a lot of data. Um, especially with tasks that don't necessarily require a lot of subject matter expertise. Um, so the question was, um, could we use this in a, in a biomedical application, which obviously does require some subject matter expertise. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, how do the costs compare? And well, as I said, setup costs and production costs. Can this be used for tasks that require domain expertise? And how do the results compare to expert curated biological databases? Because we were actually thinking at this point about, for example, trying to get publishers to um, index their information faster um, so that it could get out faster. And so one of the questions was, could we keep up with, using this kind of methodology, could you keep up with um, the curation tasks that um, say curators do? So th there's an additional twist here. We hypothesized that we could add some automatic pre-processing in here to accelerate the human annotation. Um, so entity extraction, as we all know, is doing reasonably well. Um, relation extraction is still very hard, which is illustrated by some of the descriptions of the shared tasks this morning. Um, and crowdsourcing could enable new models of annotation where you pre-process the data and then show the relationship, ask a human to validate the relationship. So that was basically what we did. Um, uh, this is uh, application number one, uh, which I'm not going to tell you about, where we actually ask people, you know, is this gene, uh, does this abstract indicate that the mutation is associated with a gene and protein, gene or protein, where we've already pre-tagged mutations and genes, and then <coughs> behind the scenes we just have, you know, basically generate all the possible pairs in each abstract of gene and mutation and ask the uh, Amazon Mechanical Turkers you know, is this right or not? So they have a yes, no question. It, it's generally pretty local. Um, so it doesn't take them very long to read this. Um, and uh, anyway, that, so I'm not going to really tell you about that one, but I am going to tell you a little bit about um, the second uh, task that we did with uh, NCBI. Uh, and it had to do with um, drug inserts and um, drug indications. So. Um, FDA gets a lot of these, about 2,000 new inserts per month, um, and NCBI is very interested in, in, in indexing the drug disease relationships. So, for example, indications for a drug, why do you take it, versus contraindications, why shouldn't you take it, risk factors, and so on. Um, so again, this was close to a very real task, although this was just a pilot to see whether it was feasible. And um, this is uh, some... This was based on previous work, um, and there's uh, an article by Orly and um, some other articles uh, where it had turned out that humans didn't do this all that wonderfully well. Um, there were about 65 to 80 percent accuracy in um, basically distinguishing between contraindications, risk factors, <coughs> and um, indications for drugs. So we decided that would be a really um, interesting test case. So NCBI did most of the heavy lifting on this. Um, we did a lot of the uh, people at MITRE did a lot of the crowdsourcing work. Um, they selected about 500 frequent searches. Um, they got the uh, subject matter experts to tag them yes or no. Um, we used the hybrid curation pipeline that I just described and Turkers were asked whether the highlighted disease or condition 
is an indication for the highlighted drug. And they had a six-way categorization, um, but basically it was a single yes category for the disease. This drug is indicated for this disease, and then a bunch of other ones um, to gather some more data. So this is, you can't read this, unfortunately, but this is what the screen looked like. So the drug here is indicated um, in the pink color, and this is all the same drug. Um, and these are, the, the green things are uh, conditions. So the questions were, um, uh, yes, this is a, uh, this is used in the treatment, prevention, and management of relief of this um, condition, major depressive disorder. And then you had a bunch of different ways of saying, no, it's a contraindication, or it's a characteristic of the disease, or it's a risk factor, and so on. So we ran that experiment. Um, the um, Turkers, we got 75, 74 Turkers. We were doing five-fold judgments. So each, each um, possible pair was presented to five Turkers, and we got five answers. Um, they were paid six cents of judgment. Um, this goes really fast, um, so they weren't get, they weren't being too horribly exploited. Um, although there are certainly ethical issues with crowdsourcing, um, did seven hundred drug labels, three thousand um, pairs of, of items that the Turkers looked at, plus twenty control twenty percent control items. These are things for which we knew the answer, and we could use that in aggregating the Turking results. Um, well, here's the really interesting part. It was, took eight hours. It cost about $1,200, and it was about $1.75 per label. And the performance was good. So precision, 96%, um, and recall was almost 90%. Uh, the, the precision, the two precision figures, well, the two accuracy figures here, one was for the fine grain, so the six-way distinction. The, the coarse one was for, um, yes, it's an indication, and no, it's not. So, um, so I've added these now to my table here, and we all of a sudden see that it's come down from weeks to days, and in fact, in one case, to hours and for the drug. So this is important if you're trying to get something done relatively quickly. What, what is not here is the fact that it took us like you know a year to set this up. Um, so that's, uh, I think it's gotten easier and it's getting easier to set up these tasks, but it does take a lot of thought. Um, and iteration to get the structure of them right so that the people who are, the Turkers are answering the questions, you know, reasonably efficiently and consistently. Um, so some initial lessons. Yes, you can, it may not take as much domain expertise as you think. It may take a, a, an ability to understand English. And um, we actually had a number of people who were interested in the task and, you know, responded this was interesting and, and fun. Um, it provides low latency, very fast turnaround, um, which is great. Um, the aggr aggregated results give, in, in the case of the drug indications, good accuracy. In the case of the gene mutations, there were some <laughs> problems in the um, automated pipeline that we used to pre-process the data that made the results not quite as good. And the cost was about 2 to $3 per abstract or drug insert. It was comparable in cost to the uh, expert curation, but much faster. So last, um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Okay. Um, yep, should be good. Uh, last one is a quick case study. Um, this used to have animation, but it got lost in the PDF <laughs> transformation. So um, so this is just what we call the tag a little, learn a little loop. You have a task and you want to you know, create a gold standard and train a tagger at the same time or create some, some ability to evaluate how well you're doing. So you mark up, in this case it was used for the de-identification, we're marking up the, <clears throat> the uh, personal health information. We train a model from that. We um, run the system and mark it automatically, um, or mark more data automatically, hand correct that data, and keep going around this loop until we think that we're um, getting reasonably good results, and then we can actually use that in some kind of production environment. And um, so <clears throat> what you see in that is the number of annotations, the number of corrections that the human is making initially is very high, but it tails off pretty quickly as the tagger gets better. And um, you can actually bootstrap a system. 
this was um, this was all PHI types over cumulative um, runs of person hours of work here, and you can see that it's going up. The name this is the name uh, performance, <clears throat> and it's it's kind of bumpy, but it, it's getting much better at the end. Um, <clears throat> so we figured at about $250 for an hour of physician time, this uh, eight-hour effort cost about $2,000, and you're getting close to something that's where the, that particular physician for this particular task was happy with the performance, but it is a, a one-off kind of activity. Um, so one-off, small scale, um, it does capture the setup and training costs. Um, it can be tailored directly to your application, which actually facilitates any kind of technology transfer that you want to do. Um, and it can support continued improvement. The disadvantages are, of course, it's hard to publish. In fact, we had a hard time publishing these results because people said, well, you didn't have an independent, you know, set of, you know, adjudicated annotations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it doesn't really work very well for shared task annotations. Um, so, uh, where do we go from here? Um, so, here are a bunch of questions, and um, my goal here is really to stimulate discussion. Um, when is it worth it to develop a gold standard? Um, you know, is there a well-defined but generalizable task? Are there already experts? Do they agree? Um, is there already annotated data that you can leverage? Um, how do you collect information? I'm sorry, the data word is overused here, but how do you collect the, the, the information on cost, quality, quantity trade-offs. We've tried uh, several times at MITRE to do this, and it's very hard. Um, so the setup time versus steady state cost, and of course, if you're going to do this over a long period of time for a large data set, you can kind of amortize the setup costs over a long period of time, but if it's just, you know, oh, I want to an annotate 100 abstracts or 100 something, it's probably, you know, a big setup time is, is deadly. Um, are cheaper approximate methods good enough? Can we use found data? Um, can we use semi-annotated automation to speed the process? Semi-automated annotation. Um, can we use crowdsource judgments? And can we put the human back in the loop? Um, which might be, first of all, would enable us to evaluate a wider range of tasks. In BioCreative, we have um, actually experimented with um, doing uh, interactive tasks, um, but they are one-off and, you know, it, it's harder to evaluate and they're less comparable. So, um, in conclusion, I wanted to acknowledge the many, many people that have uh, contributed to this work, former MITRE colleagues um, on several different activities, um, uh, external collaboration. I mentioned uh, Brad Mallon, David Carroll, David Hanauer at University of Michigan. Um, on the hybrid curation, we worked a lot with um, Jiang Wu and his team, and some folks from uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, Marcel Khan, and some other, uh, and of course my biocreative colleagues, uh, many of whom are here and who have contributed um, enormously to a lot of this research. Um, there's a set of references, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is an article that I read at the very beginning when I was starting to do some more background reading that I think it was, it is at least worth bringing to your attention. Um, it's an article called Truth is a Lie, Crowd Truth and the Seven Myths of Human Annotation. Um, and it's by folks at the IBM, um, from various parts of IBM. But um, it really lists a lot of things that I resonated with. And I think this article is worth reading. And the notion that you can actually, that the notion that disagreement is bad and something to get rid of is a really important um, myth, I think. And there are, there's been a bunch of interesting work that I'd love to uh, be able to explore about how to use disagreement. Um, and they actually propose in this paper a method of using the disagreement to um, sort of uh, simultaneously evaluating the the annotators, the, the, the questions of the instances that people are curating, and then the, the annotations themselves. And it, it's, it's, as I said, it's worth, uh, worth reading and worth thinking about. So that's it. Thank you very much.